Last Friday on SmackDown, Big E suffered a broken neck. Today we'll take a look at what happened to Big E and what we can expect moving forward. In the fateful match, his opponent, Ridge Holland, who is accustomed to injury himself, achieved suboptimal rotation and botched a belly-to-belly -belly suplex, dropping a Torre awkwardly onto his neck. The belly-to-belly -belly suplex is a dangerous maneuver that, if performed incorrectly, leaves the person being thrown in a compromised position. Ideally, the person being thrown will land on their back with the neck safely out of harm's way in a relatively neutral position. But if insufficient rotation is achieved, the victim's head and neck may collide with the floor, with all of their weight and the momentum of the throw behind the impact. Whether the neck is in extension, lateral flexion, or forward flexion, as it was in Big E's case, at the point of impact, there is certainly a risk of injury. This mechanism of injury might result in a flexion injury of the cervical spine, which could include cervical disc protrusions, cervical disc herniations, flexion teardrop fractures, fracture dislocations of the cervical spine, or ligamentous injuries of the posterior ligaments of the cervical spine. And to be honest, with the force with which Big E was slammed into the floor, there is a significant possibility of neurologic injury after this type of impact. But with Big E noted to be moving after his injury, we can see that there was not a significant neurologic injury at that time. However, lack of neurologic injury does not preclude other structural injuries which could result in persistent pain or instability of the cervical spine. Now, before we go any further, I want to take a moment to shout out today's video sponsor, Ritual Multivitamins. We've partnered up today to talk about these. Essential for Men 18 Plus. First off, what I like about this company is their transparency. This statement is pulled directly from their site. We wish multivitamins didn't have to exist. In a perfect world, we'd get all the vitamins and nutrients we need from the foods we eat every single day. And you know what? I agree. But I, like many of you, am very busy. And as a surgeon, I don't always have the time to eat regular meals at regular times. I can't always be sure that I'm getting the necessary nutrients on a daily basis. A good multivitamin is a very helpful tool to help fill in any nutrient gaps in my diet. The Ritual team has researched their product obsessively, basing their vitamin on studies that highlight the nutrients that we need versus what we're actually consuming. The 18 Plus capsule is designed for delayed release to help it bypass the stomach. And dissolve in the small intestine, an ideal place for the absorption of both fat and water-soluble vitamins. Before a long day in the operating room, I may not have the time to eat breakfast, but taking these on an empty stomach is no problem. Two capsules taken daily are a simple way to help maintain a solid nutritional foundation. From an environmental stewardship perspective, these vitamins are made traceable, which Ritual describes as transparency with receipts. From sourcing to testing to packaging, they tell you where labeled ingredients come from, why they're there, and how they're validated. Because you know, evidence does matter. If I'm gonna put something in my body, these are the things that I wanna know. They're trying to empower the consumer in more ways than one, giving us all the info and allowing us to choose what we think is best for us. And their vitamin mailers and bottles are made from 100% post-consumer recycled materials. An added bonus to a great vitamin. Follow the link in my description and use my code to get 20% off your first month. Thanks again to Ritual for sponsoring this portion of the video. AEW wrestler Taz was vocal on Twitter about Big E's injury after the incident, stressing the importance of proper technique when performing the belly-to-belly -belly suplex. I'm not sure that the onus is just on Ridge, who in other matches has performed the move with excellent technique. Both wrestlers contribute to the momentum and rotation of the move, and perhaps this botch may have been just that, a mistake. With this in mind, the comparative size of these two men may have played a role in the suboptimal rotation. Standing 6 foot 1 and billed at 253 pounds, Ridge Holland is definitely packing some muscle. While Big E is shorter, standing at only 5 foot 11, he is also considerably heavier than his opponent, weighing in at 285 pounds. No matter how strong you are, that is a lot of weight to lift up and over your head. And as these wrestlers give their all to the performance, a tiny slip or miscalculation on either of their parts could have serious consequences. But it's all part of the sport. Now, when Big E landed on his neck, he suffered an axial load to the top of his head when he was thrown forward. With this mechanism, the neck would be forced into forward flexion 
upon impact of the head with the floor. As mentioned previously, there are a number of injuries that might occur from this mechanism of injury. However, the most concerning injuries would include a burst fracture of the cervical spine, where one or more vertebrae blow out their back wall into the spinal canal and spinal cord, or a facet dislocation where one vertebrae jumps its connection with the adjoining vertebrae causing compression on or transection of the spinal cord. Neither of these injuries is desirable and both result in significant instability of the cervical spine and serious neurologic compromise. There is also a potential for a skull fracture at the top of the skull with an injury to the posterior superior aspect of the brain. And anytime that you injure the skull, you have to worry about the possibility of bleeding under the skull, either outside or inside the lining of the brain. This includes epidural, subdural and subarachnoid bleeds, any of which can kill you either quickly or over time. Initially at the time of injury, it is not possible to determine exactly what the pattern of injuries that had occurred is. This will be determined by subsequent physical examination and diagnostic imaging once Big E has arrived in the hospital. However, initial observation of motor activity in his extremities at the time of injury is certainly a good sign, suggesting that spinal shock is not present and that there has not been catastrophic injury to the spine or the spinal cord. Spinal shock is an altered physiologic state that occurs immediately after a spinal cord injury, whose presence is demonstrated by a loss of spinal cord function caudal to or below the level of the injury, with flaccid paralysis, anesthesia, absent bowel and bladder control, and loss of reflex activity. Of course, a lack of neurologic findings at the time of injury is not an absolute certainty that subsequent neurologic injury mightn't occur later as swelling associated with the injury progresses and compresses neurologic elements later. After the injury, Big E was put on a stretcher and received immediate medical attention at UAB in Birmingham. He posted a video on Twitter that night and although he was wearing a neck brace, his smile was reassuring. Uh, I can move all my digits. You see that? That's nice. That's always a good thing. Um, strength feels fine. Being able to move your digits after breaking your neck is a good sign. This implies that motor pathways from the brain through the spinal cord and into the peripheral nerves of the upper extremity are still intact, which in turn means that they haven't been cut or squished by bone or swelling. For the time being, Big E is safe. Big E posted another video to Twitter sharing further information on his injury. Uh, the C1 and C6 are indeed fractured, not displacement though. I don't have any damage to my spinal cord, no ligament damage. With fractured C1 and C6 vertebrae, but no damage to the spinal cord and no ligament damage, he will not have to undergo surgery. And no surgery, which I'm very thankful for. He dodged a bullet as many variables could have resulted in necessary surgical fixation. Fortunately, his fractures are non-displaced, which refers to the relationship of the fracture fragments to one another. A C1 or atlas vertebral fracture usually occurs after an axial load injury. The associated fracture pattern is determined by the force that is applied in conjunction with the axial load. In the case of axial load and forward flexion, Fractures of the anterior arch of the C1 vertebrae often occur. Patients usually do not have spinal cord injury or neurologic deficits with atlas fractures because the fracture fragments spread outwards or radially. However, the vertebral arteries are at high risk of injury as a result of dissection, thrombosis, or spasm due to inflammation, which can result in later neurological deficits. C1 fractures are primarily treated non-operatively. If isolated, atlas fractures can be effectively managed with eight to 12 weeks of external immobilization of the head and neck, which could include a rigid collar or cervical traction. Collar immobilization or cervical traction is usually sufficient to allow for proper healing. However, the type of orthosis required varies based on the relative stability of the fracture fragments and the number of fracture fragments involved. Non-operative immobilization might include a rigid collar, halo vest, or a Minerva jacket. Soft collars are not adequate for immobilization and can result in worsening pain as a result of uncontrolled neck motion and further fracture displacement. After immobilization, dynamic imaging studies such as flexion extension films are required to confirm 
inadequate immobilization and to rule out late instability. The primary consideration for surgery is instability, which is demonstrated by the presence of mobility on flexion and extension x-ray films. The surgical approach and instrumentation for the treatment of unstable C1 fractures is determined largely by the presence of associated injuries to the cervical spine. So the extent of associated trauma will determine the appropriate course of treatment for the C1 fracture. As Big E noted on his social media channels, his injuries did not require surgery. So this suggests that C6 fracture was somewhat stable. Given the mechanism of injury, we would anticipate the fracture pattern most likely present was a compression fracture, where the vertebrae is loaded axially. Since there was forward flexion at the same time, the compression force would be concentrated on the anterior or the front aspect of the vertebrae. If minor, this would result in only a marginal loss of height of the anterior aspect of the vertebral body. If more serious, this would result in significant collapse of the anterior aspect of the vertebral body and retropulsion of the back wall of the vertebral body into the spinal canal, possibly with impingement of the spinal cord. With the former, only one of the spinal columns described by Denis is involved and the spinal column retains its overall stability. However, if the posterior aspect of the vertebral body is also involved, two of the three columns of Denis become involved and the spine loses its stability. The former can be treated with rigid immobilization or non-operative treatment whereas the latter requires open reduction and internal fixation with surgical implants. Fortunately, this was not the case for Big E, and it appears that rigid collar immobilization will be sufficient to stabilize his cervical fractures. I, know, I feel like I sound like a broken record, but I am very grateful, and uh, I'm gonna be all right. Big E's road to recovery will entail rigid collar immobilization for eight to 12 weeks until healing of the fractures is confirmed. He will undergo serial imaging with radiographs and CT to assess his healing and to ensure that malunion or the development of non-anatomic fracture union does not occur. And a pro tip, if you're gonna break your neck, do it in Birmingham. They've been great. Everyone here at UAB has been great. After healing has been confirmed, he will start physical therapy to restore the range of motion and the strength of his neck, back, and upper extremity muscles. The goal will be first to restore range of motion and normal function before later progressing to the mobility, strength, and endurance that is required for him to return to competitive action in the WWE. He is obviously a strong, optimistic individual, and I hope he is able to maintain that attitude throughout the recovery process. After suffering a neck injury, Edge returned to wrestling approximately one year after cervical stabilization surgery. However, this was not the end of his problems. In the years that followed, Edge began to develop a narrowing of the spinal column both above and below his initial fusion. The resultant development of arthritis at the adjacent levels changed his spine in such a way that subsequent surgery was necessary. For more information about Edge's neck injuries, you can check out my video about that topic. I'll leave a link in the description down below. In Big E's case, only rigid external immobilization is required so the overall mobility of his cervical spine will be preserved after rehabilitation leaving him with normal function once fully rehabbed Big E can carry on as normal with no particular precautions required none other than not being belly to belly suplexed onto his head on the concrete again after dodging a bullet with not one but two cervical fractures that escaped serious neurologic consequences why tempt fate again? If all goes according to plan, Big E should be able to return to the ring so that he can continue to fight for the WWE Championship. Thanks to my sponsor Ritual for allowing me to bring this video to you. Be sure to let me know what topics you want me to discuss in my upcoming videos. As always, that's been a word from Dr. Chris, not your everyday oracle. They tell me my neck is broken, so there's that.